Namaste and welcome to Nepal Conversations. Nepal Conversation is a podcast series where we talk to scholars and researchers about the interesting work on various aspects of Nepal. We ask them to reflect on old and new problems, challenges and possibilities confronting contemporary Nepali society. The theme for Nepal Conversations second season is gender. We will present a series of conversations on the topic of gender and sexuality and what it means for Nepal. Our guest today is Sarah Parker, who is an associate professor in development studies at the Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. She has recently been elected chair of the Britain Nepal Academic Council and is a committee member on the Britain Nepal NGO network. She has conducted participatory action research in Nepal since 1994 and has worked in the areas of gender and education, aging in Nepal, as well as on the rise of fair trade in the global south. She is currently completing a British Academy funded Global Challenges Research Fund project, Dignity Without Danger, exploring menstrual stigma and taboos in Nepal. Sarah is committed to collaborative research and utilizes a range of visual and participatory methods in her teaching, research, and community engagement. Oh, welcome to Nepal Conversation, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us today. You have uh, worked on a range of issues in Nepal over 25 years now. Could you tell us a bit about how you first came to be in Nepal and your journey through these diverse topics of interest? Hi, yes, and uh, thank you for having me. I actually went to school in Singapore at United World College, and when I finished my international baccalaureate, went on a school trip in 1986 and did the Annapurna circuit. So that was the first time that I went to Nepal. And then after finishing my uh, degree in geography and working as a research assistant and teaching English, I went back and volunteered and lived in Cyclis in Kaski in 1992. And when I was there, I volunteered with ACAP, but also taught in the local school. And this was kind of a life-changing opportunity for me because it gave me the depth of knowledge and the time living in a a remote village. It was like an eight-hour trek into the hills. So teaching there was my first contact with Nepal. And when I came back, I did my Master's in Development Studies at Bath University. So um, I kind of then linked my experiences in Nepal to my studies and my Master's that looked at non-formal education. And then when I started working at John Moores University, I was very fortunate um, to go to Nepal practically every year for two months um, to do research. And this led me on a journey to look at non-formal education because when I kept going back to Nepal, feeding back my research, talking to the local women in particular, but the wider community, the women kept stressing that they wanted uh, proud shiksha, they wanted non-formal education. And ActionAid launched its Reflect programme in 1996. And I helped to facilitate this into the cyclist sector and subsequently did my PhD on a part-time basis. And it focused on non-formal education, empowerment, um, and participatory sort of action research. As part of this, that led to British Council and then ODI funded and finally DFID funded connections between the centre, uh, CERID, the Centre for Education, and also Padma Kanya, uh, Gender and Women's Studies. So my research over the past 30 years has always centred around action research, collaborative research, working with local women, but a strong focus on gender, whether that's gender and conflict or gender and education, gender and health, and my current Dignity Without Danger research project. Following on from my PhD, though, um, I also um, engaged with a community participatory photography project in Cyclis, which led to exhibitions and the publication of a sort of a coffee table book, which featured photographs by local people representing their own lives. Along the journey has also sort of done quite a lot of collaborative research. I had a small grant looking at ageing in Nepal um, with Bijan Pant from Liverpool University, working with Kadambari School of Social Work, a small British Academy project looking at the impact of rewashable menstrual kits following the earthquake, So I think it's fair to say that my research journey in Nepal has been one that's been based on listening to local people's voices and organisations and trying to work on on things which people feel are important at the time. That is a lot of work that you have done in Nepal. And I remember 
listening to you talk about menstruation um, a few years ago, um, I think you had something going on before Dignity Without Danger as well. Um, so you are currently finishing this project on menstrual stigma and taboos in Nepal. And in the book that is coming out of this project, you talk about taking an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to understanding menstrual projects or practices, sorry. What does such, such an approach mean in Nepal's context? Okay, so just to pick up on the first thing that you said, the project did arise out of a small funded British Academy project that was looking um, at the, the distribution and use of rewashable sanitary kits which now are referred to as menstrual kits or freedom kits or dignity kits. And this became particularly in the limelight following the earthquake when it was in the news that people were vulnerable post-earthquake, um, in particular being excluded from spaces, trying to manage your menstruation at a time of a crisis was particularly challenging. We also had a number of small NGOs working in Nepal who had given out these kits to help keep girls in school because um, menstruation and not being able to manage it um, in, in a sort of, in a, a way which gives you dignity. The findings from this project that led to the bigger project, Dignity Without Danger, that we're doing now. And one of the key findings was that there's no point just giving out products and focus on hygiene. You need to have much more um, a holistic approach. You need to understand the deep cultural um, religious beliefs that underpin people's practices and the stigmas and taboos that surround menstruation. And also need to focus not just on that one narrative that dominates um, the menstrual landscape in the pool of the sort of the image of the cow shed and being excluded uh, with Chapaudi. Um, if you actually Google the term menstruation in the pool and then click on images, the main image that you get is women, single people, uh, women or girls in, in, in cow sheds. And this is because obviously Every year, tragically, people um, are recorded to die um, from smoke inhalation or snake bites. Um, but it's only in certain parts of Nepal and actually menstrual stigmas and taboos are much more complex um, and varied across the whole of Nepal. So there's a massive movement to try to address, to challenge, to put policies in place, to make menstruation something which is a safe, healthy experience, but also to break the silence that surrounds it. So it's really important that you work across uh, disciplines, across multi-sectors um, and different agencies. So when I put in the bid um, for the project, we included from the onset six NGO partners, two from health, two from WASH and two from education. And we've developed strong links with the Menstrual Health and Hygiene Management Partnership Alliance, which is a collective of probably about 80 NGOs working in this field. Um, at different levels from grassroots level all the way through to ministries, people who are pushing policies. So there's a very vibrant activist movement in the pool and that isn't captured. So it's definitely something which is a topic that needed exploring um, from a more sociological perspective. Um, but you also need to acknowledge that you're working across sectors. Um, so it requires um, people in an enterprise and a business approach. It requires a a gendered lens. It also requires looking at geography and location and all of those intersections that impact on someone's experience um, of their monthly menstruation. So to do that, we employed six researchers um, locally recruited uh, through Chibivan University. Madhu Sudam Sibedi is my co I in Nepal. And these six researchers have been to all seven provinces to conduct sort of ethnographic observation focus groups quite immersive uh, research we're now currently finishing off the project but then we've also used that information and worked with creative artists in the ball to engage with a much broader audience so it's also important that we get the messages out and the stories from our research and also the discussion out of that kind of echo chamber we want to talk to people about menstruation across all different sectors you know all different levels so to do that we've used art projects um, we've engaged women in the far west making films about their menstrual practices building on work conducted by sarah bauman 
We've worked with Jay from Stories of Nepal, who's done blogs of people's experiences in the west of Nepal. And he has a series that he'll be sharing in the next few months from eastern Nepal. So when I say it's intersectional, it's not just about the intersecting disciplines. It intersects um, at so many different levels. And it comes back to this big need to focus on more complex understandings of the nuances of things like caste, gender, age, generational, um, all of those factors that can impact on people's experiences. And for me as well, it's also centers on the need for education to not just be in schools, but it needs to be at the community level as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. That, that sounds amazing. Um, and thank you so much for uh, your work on this very important topic. Your project, as you mentioned, is um, titled Dignity Without Danger. And these two words, dignity and danger, are two very heavy words. How might dignity and danger play out differently in understanding menstrual practices in Nepal compared to other contexts, such as uh, the UK? And what connections are there to be learned from this? Yeah, now this is a really good question because um, the title came um, from Mary Douglas's work um, and her book, uh, Purity and Danger, where a menstruating woman um, or girl, um, and it's not only uh, women and girls who menstruate, I think that needs to be noted, but the dominant narrative does surround their experiences. Um, so dignity, is something which needs to be unpicked because women are seen as being powerful, as being able to bring misfortune. Um, when they have their menstruation, the menstrual blood is, is perceived as being impure and having this possibility to bring uh, danger and misfortune to your family, where we all know that menstrual blood um, is just a bodily fluid. It comes every month. It's something which is being challenged, this idea that it is um, considered to be impure. And there's a strong movement in Nepal, but also globally to promote dignified menstruation. And the Menstrual Health and Hygiene Partnership Alliance are pushing to have a policy on dignified menstruation to be ratified. And you have Radha Pradel Foundation who started the Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation, um, pushing for menstruation to be seen in its entirety through the whole life cycle and dignity to be experienced at all levels, not just in terms of managing it, but in also to be able to talk about it and to do, be free to practice and do whatever you want while menstruating. But the actual word dignity and dignified menstruation um, does need unpicking at the local level because dignity is very personal, it's, it's subjective, what one person's experience or expectations are of dignity may be different to another's. Um, and there are tensions brought up with trying to push and challenge some of the stigmas and taboos, given the links to the religious um, beliefs, which are very deeply embedded. And so therefore you need to treat local people with dignity and respect their views. Um, and this is something that can be quite challenging when you want to promote a healthy experience free from any discrimination, um, but also trying to acknowledge and respect people's beliefs systems. Um, so dignity is really at the heart of the project. And I think it's something which actually isn't for me just to answer, but is something which the collective network needs to really reflect more on. Um, to unpick what does it mean and how can it be promoted and how can it be contextualized um, because having a dignified menstruation is everybody's right. Being free from harm um, is also essential. Um, and we can all agree that no one should be um, made to suffer uh, for something which is just a natural biological process. Um, so it's something that we're looking at in terms of as a project team, but I think it is a discussion which needs to be had with a wider audience. Can I have a follow up question? on this. You often talk about caste and ethnicity and class. So I was wondering when you are there in Nepal, we are working uh, as academics or as activists or as lobbyists from our own positions within the caste ethnic or class hierarchies or gender hierarchies. 
So I was just wondering what the discourse is around what dignity really means and what danger really means in Nepal's context. Okay, so um, I think it's important to note that in the research team that we employed, um, we had a mix of, they were, uh, it was all females, six females, but we had a mix of ages, castes, marital status, ethnicities, um, and this, it, this impacted on the research process and was really important that we had a, a mixed team because everybody sees things through their own lens, through their own uh, positionality, as you mentioned. And one of the things that the researchers did was keep diaries, uh, not just of the research process, but of their feelings, of how they interacted in the field, of how they viewed what they were listening to and the stories and narratives that were being shared with them. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, that sort of data analysis process um, brings in your positionality and your own subjective feelings. So that's something that we're going to be writing on over the next couple of months. When I go to Nepal, we're going to have some workshops that unpick and delve into the diaries. And in terms of dignity, um, the key components that have come out from the whole um, of the seven different provinces is having um, the ability to manage your menstrual cycle, but with having a choice of products. So one aspect is, is to have a choice so that you're not forced to use a particular type of product. You can have, you know, know what options are available um, and those options are increasing. Uh, you've now not just got the pads, you've got menstrual pants, you've got the menstrual cup. Um, there's also the disposable as well and people need to have knowledge and awareness of the pros and cons of all of those different types of products. Um, but in terms of dignity at the local level, it is also about being respected and not isolated um, and creating spaces to talk about menstruation um, can have a significant role in creating um, a sense of, of dignity. With the word dignity, um, not everybody wants to get on board with pushing dignified menstruation exactly because it is complex and it is contextual. There's a movement, for example, one of the things you, you're, you're not supposed to do when you're menstruating is go to temples or um, attend religious ceremonies. But the younger generation are now starting to challenge this and, you know, go to events and break some of these sort of um, perceptions and customs. And that brings them dignity, but you shouldn't be forced to or feel that you have to uh, do things that you don't want to do. So quite a lot of our older participants that we've interviewed, and Grandma is a good example of this. In the film that was made in Kanchanpur, we have two films. One is called Stay Away, which is um, a drama that local people wrote. And they, they wrote it, filmed it, performed it, and we've just edited it together. And the other one is um, a documentary called Eight Days. But in the drama, um, it the, the, the narrative and the story is about how um, a grandma in the village believes that she has become sick because she's touched and been touched by a menstruating woman. She goes to the health post, she sees a traditional healer, and through the drama tells the story of how she won't break, she won't blame her menstruating daughter in law again for her misfortune. But she also makes it very clear that she will also not change or break her own practices because sprinkling cow urine. Um, doing the rituals gives her dignity so it's something which is just an ongoing discussion and needs looking at and contextualizing more um, it's one of the sort of challenges that we're facing is trying to generalize when actually I don't think you can generalize about anyone's experience because everyone is different thank you Sarah um, and, and that is what I find so important about your work as well how you're bringing in these diverse perspectives instead of um, only maybe looking at feminist perspectives, which might then sometimes ignore all of these complexities as well. Um, but what you're saying about the films brings us to the next question we have. Um, participatory and visual research methods have been central in your work since the beginning, um, from your PhD on non-formal education in Nepal, 
and the community photography project in Cyclis that you mentioned, to the storybook you have co-written for primary school children, and now and these two documentaries for Dignity Without Danger. So why these methods and why in Nepal? I think for me, I am a very collaborative, participatory researcher. Um, it's kind of in my nature. Some people have a calling for one or the other. Um, and I'm also quite visual. I've photographed, for example, when I lived in Cyclis and kept going back to Cyclis on an annual basis, played quite an important role on reflection. I didn't realise at the time, but in, in developing relationships with people. So in the late, well, in the 90s, um, taking photographs back to communities was quite powerful. Now everybody has mobile phones and it's less important, uh, but it helped me to build up relationships with people I knew, but also people outside of my social networks as well. Um, it was always appreciated when I took, took photographs back. And the photography project in Cyclis came very fortuitous that, that I had a spare camera and I'd made a postcard to give to the local community, which has a number of pictures on just as a thank you. And it was actually the local people in Cyclis that said, we could sell these and we can make money for our community, for our youth group and our women's group. And I was going, well, you could, but surely it would be better if they were your pictures, not mine. And that just led quite fluidly and naturally to this photography project. Um, and it was it was very powerful um, to hand over that. Um, well, not even to hand over, because I wasn't really handing it over. It was, it was kind of their idea and I supported it. Um, and it led to a photography exhibition and the book. Um, you mentioned as well the Frog book, which is um, fairies, it's about fair trade in a children's book. And I just think that creative means of engaging people in talking about issues, whether it's gender or trade or um, menstruation currently, I think visual methods and multimedia methods are really important so that you're engaging different people. And we worked with Carlo 101, who put out a call for art. And please do check out and I can share their virtual exhibition. They received art from all over Nepal and said it was one of the actual most inclusive, uh, diverse shows that they'd ever done. And that was during COVID. Um, and it led to this sort of virtual exhibition, as well as an online uh, book of the art that was submitted. So it cuts across generations and different areas and um, focused on menstrual products. And I think, again, use, using and working with creative medium, such as the post that Jay does on Stories of Nepal. So when we've done our research, we have to keep participants anonymous. Uh, but when Jay goes in and does his blogs, it's very clear. It's got a full sort of consent process. People are then quite happy for, to share their stories. So it meant that you can connect stories to people. And I think that gives it a warmth and a depth which people can relate to more. Um, I think in future, I would probably embed this method into the research from the start um, because we have some amazing film footage and we have some photographs that um, at the moment we can't share the photographs because we haven't been able to go back to the field to share those with the people to gain their full consent. We do have the consent to use their photographs, but without them seeing the story and the narrative that goes with it, um, we don't feel that we can share that. So that's something to build on in the future. Um, we've also actually also interviewed 34 menstrual activists in Nepal, and we'll be exhibiting their photographs um, as part of the Menstrual Health and Hygiene Day, uh, the 27th and 28th of May. Um, and we're gonna be sharing their stories in an online and also published book. Um, but I think visualizing helps connect and we live in a world where to get people's attention, um, you need to have a visual element. So I think visual methods is something which needs to be incorporated more in the future to, to research projects and is definitely something I want to continue doing. But out of all the methods, the one that I would say is the most empowering and insightful has been the collaborative filmmaking because we really did literally hand over the camera to the women and they, because of COVID, we did go back and support when we could or the team in Nepal did. Um, but they had complete control about what they filmed. The drama that they made was their idea. They've also recorded five songs 
um, and filmed them. And they're all available on YouTube, on the Dignity Without Danger YouTube channel. And we're going back to at their request to show it to the local policymakers um, the week after this. Um, they want to show the film again in the community. Uh, they had the opportunity, we brought the 13 people, we brought 10 of them who were able to come to Kathmandu and they showed their film at the Kathmandu International Mountain Film Festival in December just gone and also shared it to policymakers. So the filmmaking has been the most um, empowering because it has not only handed over the process to the women and given them control about what they filmed, but they've also now got a platform and become more confident that this method to be replicated is expensive and time consuming. And that's one of the challenges that you face with using creative methods is having the funding available uh, to do that. So that's a key lesson that I've taken away from the project is to make sure that in projects as I move forward, you have funds to be creative and flexible and respond to the local level not just go in with your set process and your set methods that you're going to use. So it's kind of emerged from uh, meetings with people like Carlo, meeting Jay, also meeting Sarah Bauman at the start of the project. Um, so having a strong network and the fact I've been working in the pool for 30 years and have worked with so many different organisations, it's all come together in this project, which has been brilliant. And also working with Global Action Nepal, um, who are very much focused on promoting quality education, really does encourage you to think outside of the box. So we've also developed with the Menstrual Network an education toolkit, uh, which is bringing together all of this fantastic material that already exists in Nepal and linking it to the current revisions of the curriculum. So I think visual methods are important, but the collaboration as well is key working with partners um, who, who you trust and who are inspirational really, and working with a very big team, uh, which I appreciate very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Just to follow up on that, in all your projects, as you have mentioned, you have worked with a range of uh, people. Um, how have you brought together insights from these diverse groups of people, including academics, activists, and civil society partners? Uh, what are the ways in which you have ensured uh, productive dialogues between different partners? And what are the lessons you have learned from these partnerships? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the things that I need to sort of acknowledge, and it goes back to the start, um, when I said that when I first went to Nepal, I was supported by lots of small amounts of money, you know, by my university, by small projects, uh, by higher education links. Um, the DFID uh, Delphi one was particularly useful. And what this small amount of funding and network funding um, has created is trust over a long period of time. I've seen a lot of people go to Nepal, do their research and leave. And it's not necessarily that they don't want to go back, but often the funding or the opportunity isn't there to keep going back. So I think over time, um, building up genuine relationships um, has really helped with the collaborative process. But also when you're working with academics and activists and policy makers, um, having workshops and bringing people together in person has been really important and I'm really glad that we had lots of workshops at the start of the project uh, to do that, to create spaces to even the partners, the six NGO partners we had, I consulted them whilst I was writing the bid. Um, so engaging them right from the start and in, so, and in many ways it was a response to gaps that people were telling us existed in Nepal. So that helps. Um, with Dignity Without Danger, obviously we had COVID and that did impact on our ability to meet, um, but maintaining an online presence, obviously using the sort of Zoom and other means of meeting has been really important. But I would say that meeting in person is really, really important because you can build up those relationships much better in person. And I think being able to listen um, is, is absolutely essential and not coming in with your own agenda, being open to new ideas. Um, I use a lot of 
sorts of visual methods and participatory methods in workshops that I run to try and make sure everyone has a voice. Well, everyone has a voice, but everyone's voice is heard and given a space to be heard. Um, but I think working with people who you know are committed to sort of creative participatory methods as well has been very, very important. Um, I think that's been at the heart of everything I've done is working with excellent people in Nepal. Uh, and how um, how have you ensured a productive dialogue between the different partners? Is that something that you've been able to do as well? Yeah, so um, one of the things that um, is, is good in Nepal is you do have a very strong network. So you have the Menstrual Health and Hygiene Management Partnership Alliance, which creates a space for partners to come together in a much broader context. Um, in the first two years of the project, I actually made sure that there was funding in the budget to meet work with the partners, uh, the six NGO partners that I mentioned, but also that there was some funding to support the work they were doing. Because I think too often when researchers go in, especially to work with, I'd say, the NGO community, um, there's an expectation that they'll just want to, to give their time. But time is precious and networking takes time and effort. Um, and actually having the small pots of funds available for the NGOs we were working with helped them in their work. So it helped them do outreach work. Um, as a result, um, things like Global Action Nepal also made radio programs um, to, to sort of talk about menstruation and that pulled in the wider network. So the, the six NGO partners that we were working with, one of the things that they critiqued of some of the visual methods is it wasn't getting out to the more remote communities and to reach out to the wider communities in Nepal, radio is the perfect medium so there is a whole series, um, 27 radio stations broadcast uh, weekly uh, radio programmes on menstruation, which featured many of our partners, but also other people who we met along the way, other activists who shared their time. So I think um, making sure that you can support the partners in their own initiatives, as well as in the bigger picture of researching the topic that you're interested in. And it probably will lead to new research in different areas. Um, you know, people are coming up with ideas of what is next. And one of the things that we do need to do is look at and work on the material which exists in the form surrounding menstruation to be more inclusive um, in terms of being available and accessible to people with multiple abilities. Um, and we need to look at how to get the material out into the schools and into the community and that's beyond the research project, but it's something which I'll remain committed to. Once the research project is over, Dignity Without Danger, I don't think will end. I think because of the connections to the local partners, um, it will continue in some form. And that's one of the challenges and one of the things that we'll be looking at when we're together next week, uh, having some end of research project workshops. So it's looking how, at how you can sustain um, and build on what's been done as well and not just move on to the next project, which I know we're all under pressure to, to keep researching sort of topical projects, but this one still has a lot more work that can be done in terms of dissemination and looking at those areas and gaps that we've missed. Thanks, Sarah. I have a little um, follow-up question, which is more of because of my own curiosity. Because I think my generation of women still grew up using the cloth pads. And I was wondering how the cloth pads were received in Nepal when you took the menstrual kits there. Okay, well, that's interesting because I'm, I, this is a sort of a misconception. I've never taken any kits. I was evaluating people in Nepal who were giving them out. So there's the first piece of research was myself and Kay standing at my uni. And we were evaluating kits that were being locally made, locally distributed. Um, and there's kind of almost not two different audiences, but you have um, sort of an urban audience who have got access to alternative products, disposable. But then in many remote areas, there is no alternative. So the cloth pads um, and kits were very well received. 
Um, in some places, um, the kits were being given out and people hadn't even really considered that, that the women that they were giving them to didn't actually wear the knickers required to put the pads into. So again, it just goes back to how context is really important. Um, but you've also got an audience who are choosing to go to rewashable products, whether they're cloth pads, there's also now uh, period pants available in the fall. Um, the menstrual cup is surprisingly being um, taken up. And when I say surprisingly, when you talk about menstruation and managing it with a menstrual cup, a lot of people will say, oh, well, religious and cultural stigmas and taboos prevent women and girls using cups. But actually, um, there's lots of evidence to show that in, in different places with knowledge um, and awareness, that, that the cup is actually really being taken up quite well. So it's about having the awareness of the different products. Um, and I think the younger generation, um, there's a shift to using menstrual cloths that are rewashable from an environmental perspective and a health perspective. Um, and there's a lot of people um, celebrating and it's sharing their stories on social media. And all of this does help to break down silence that surrounds menstruation which I think is probably one of the most important things that's needed in order to tackle stigmas and taboos is to talk about it um, from a biological point of view social cultural talking about pain that you feel and the emotionals and hormones including how you experience your first period all the way through to the menopause um, as you know in the UK at the moment the menopause is quite a hot topic to the point where we've now got a shortage of HRT um, gel at the moment because people are starting to talk about it. And that's here in the UK. Globally, it's the same. It's a global issue. It's not just the Nepalese issue. So in many ways, Nepal is actually quite vibrant and ahead of the game in some ways because people really are talking about it and getting it into the media. Um, and with the different products, it's going to be personal. Some people will prefer disposable, others want to use more environmentally friendly solutions. Um, but you did touch on the fact that the younger generation, I think, are the, the change makers. And the younger generation don't necessarily want to upset or offend their, their, their elders. Um, but they do and are starting to change their practices and they don't want to practice, pass on any practices which may be harmful to, the young, to, to their future generations. So there is quite a lot of evidence of change and there is more availability of choice of different products, which I think is really important. Thank you so much, Sarah. We have uh, now come to the end of the conversation, uh, but before we go, could you tell us a bit about your current and future project? What else are you working on right now? So at the moment, um, I'm in the final phase of this uh, British Academy project. So I'm going to Nepal on Wednesday, working with the team. I'll be going back in July to launch the activist book that I mentioned that has 34 stories of menstrual activists. And working with the team on writing and reflecting um, to unpick some of the questions that you've asked me today, because some of them I can't necessarily answer. I need to talk to my team about that because um, it's really important that their voices um, are included um, in the research sort of findings. And then following on from this project, I want to see how I can continue um, supporting uh, promotion of sort of um, dignified menstruation. Um, so we need to try to look at how is dignity without danger going to be sustained after the research project ends? Um, how will that continue? How will we get some of our material into all the different areas of Nepal? So, how, so dissemination um, is going to be really important. I'd also like to connect with the wider South Asia network uh, working in this area, because I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned um, from sort of the South Asian network, menstrual health and hygiene, uh, dignified menstruation network. Um, but I think as well, I'm really keen to uh, continue working with creative methods and responding to local requests for research. One example of that is the filmmakers in Western Nepal 
um, have said in terms of feedback about the impact of the film, they want to look at issues surrounding young people and uh, migration and the use of uh, drugs and the impact that's having on their community. So the challenge now is when you do grounded research, when you do get ideas from people of things that they want to explore, how do you then find the funding to support them in their endeavours to do their own sort of research? So I think to continue to respond to and work with local partners, um, I'd like to further the work on menstruation, but also I'm open to uh, some of the other issues that people want to look at, because I think research is mo most powerful for me when it's action research and it's responding to a request from the ground. So hopefully people will can contact me um, and we can continue to develop the networks. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's brilliant. It was really nice to know about all your work and uh, really important things that you've been doing. Good luck with your future projects. And thank you so much for uh, joining us today and your time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. No, thank you.